The appellant may reserve it for five minutes for rebuttal. If you're the repellent, wish to reserve any time, you let me know when you get started. I'm keeping the clock, and I can let you know about the passage of time. We've read the briefs. We're ready to see who you are. Jessica was um, found to be in contempt by the trial court in Wayne County for failure to comply with an order in her divorce decree which required her to pay a vehicle debt, the debt of which was in her ex-husband's name. And uh, in addition to being required under the decree to pay the debt, she was to hold, uh, uh, she was to hold Mr. Peter Schein uh, harmless. Um, she made monthly payments, but eight of them were late, and as a result, each month, um, Mr. Peter Stein received and noticed that his loan was in default. She also missed two payments uh, shortly after the divorce in 2014, and I believe in early 2015. In any event, she missed two payments. And there's no question that she had not paid that loan in a timely fashion. There's no question that she had failed to hold her former husband harmless because his credit was affected. In fact, he was turned down for a loan, and this is one of the reasons why. Excuse me, was she also ordered to pay the court costs and attorney's fees? She was actually for the contempt. She was sentenced to three days in jail. She was fined $250, and she was given six months to pay $1,350 of attorney fees, Mr. Peter Shine. That were the result of work on the contempt or that were previously ordered by the... Uh, the the attorney fees arose out of the prosecuting the contempt. Thank you. And if she paid the attorney fees within six months, there was a hearing scheduled about six months later. To see if she, yeah. And when we use the word purge, I think it's important to understand that it can have several meanings. And the, the uh, purge in this case meant that the court would not impose the jail time and fine if she paid the $1,350. But it did not purge her of the contempt because that had already occurred. And at the time of the contempt being filed by Mr. Peter Scheim, she in fact was not only current on the loan, but she was paid ahead. And within 50 days of the motion being filed in July of 2015, she had uh, paid off the loan in full by virtue of trading in the vehicle, on the new vehicle. So when she came to see me, maybe a couple months after the uh, contempt was filed against her, there was nothing else she could do to comply with the court's order. She complied with the court's order. The debt was paid in full by virtue of trading in. And she could not undo whatever damage she had done to Mr. Peter Shine's credit. Um, as a result, any it appeared to me that any sanctions that the court imposed on her would have to be in the form of punishment, not in the form of remedial purging to coerce her to comply with a valid existing order. This court in Harvey versus Harvey, which I cite on my uh, pages 7 and 8 of my brief, discussed the important distinctions between criminal contempt and civil contempt. In a nutshell, if a person is found in contempt for failure to comply with an existing order, which they violated, the contempt order is given an opportunity to purge himself or herself by complying with the existing order. The purpose of sanctions in civil contempt is to coerce compliance with the exist compliance with the existing order. At the time of this hearing, 
In fact, within 50 days of the filing of the motion, the hearing wasn't held until about eight months later, almost nine months. She was in compliance with the underlying order to pay the obligation to pay the discharge in full. But she had not paid the attorney's fees that were ordered at the contempt hearing. Wasn't this more, I see a, uh, but you agree with me that a criminal contempt is more, to, goes more towards preserving the authority of a court, whereas a civil contempt is to force obedience with the court's order? In this case, perhaps, the order to pay those attorney's fees? The, um, a criminal contempt is to punish for failure to obey an existing court order. And there's no question that the court punished her by imposing this sentence. However, at the very beginning of this hearing, it's reflected at page four of the transcript, I ask on behalf of my client, is the court proceeding in criminal contempt or is the court proceeding in civil contempt? Counsel for Mr. Petersheim indicated that we're proceeding in civil contempt only. The magistrate indicated, both at the time and in his decision, that the proceedings were in civil contempt. That would indicate that for civil contempt to occur, Jessica had to be given the chance to comply with an existing order. Not a new order to pay attorney fees. Not a new order uh, of some other strike. But an existing order, and she'd already complied with it. So the... Um is the only way to clear up the, the due process argument allegation, it would have been for the court through the contempt proceedings, because let's assume the court could still have found her to be in contempt and, and then would make the order for attorney's fees to be paid. And let's say it said within 30 days she'll pay the attorney's fees. But if that didn't happen, there needed to be a subsequent contempt motion filed for her failure to pay and a subsequent purge order. Is that the only way to clear up what you have argued is a due process violation in this particular case? The, um, the, the lack of due process occurred at the first hearing. And the reason is, be, and we didn't know it at the time because we thought the court was proceeding in civil contempt. And if proceeding in civil contempt, the only sanctions that could issue would be to coerce her to uh, give her a reason to comply with the court order, if you will. And then look back at some future point in time whether or not she had complied. The court couldn't do that in this case. Instead, it could only issue a new order. And the new order was go to jail, pay a fine or pay these attorney fees. And I might, and, and going to your question, Your Honor, if we assume, let's assume that she did not have the money to pay $1,350 come September 19th, which is her so-called purge hearing, what would the court do? The court would impose a fine of $250 and send her to the jail. Would the court also forgive the $1,350? Absolutely not. That's a valid court order. Now she can be found in contempt again for not obeying the court order to pay $1,350. None of this has to do with the original court order in her divorce decree where she was ordered to pay a vehicle loan in her husband's name, her then husband's name, and was subsequently found in contempt. Then I will change my question slightly and say, is the due process violation related to the fact that she couldn't hold him harmless at the time that the hearing was held? Because the trial court found she was, she was in contempt for failing because she didn't hold him harmless. And she did not hold him harmless. Right, so but the, the, qu no the question becomes, is there any civil sanction remedy for that? And the answer is no. That bell has already been rung. The only thing the court could do is punish her, which the court did. However, by doing so, they were imposing criminal uh, sanctions, and my client was not afforded due process. She was not given notice that it was a criminal proceeding, and she testified at the hearing, which she had a right not to do, and the burden of proof for criminal sanctions is beyond a reasonable doubt, and the court said in its decision 
They found clear and convincing evidence, which is the proper standard for a civil contempt, but they didn't find her in civil. Uh, I mean, this finding, this sanction is not a civil uh, contempt sanction. I think it's important, when I talk to other lawyers, and even some judges, it is bantered about that as long as the contempt nor is given an opportunity to purge themselves, then it is civil contempt. Or if the contempt nor is not sent to jail, then it's civil contempt. That's nonsense. And that's not true. That's not the law. Harvey discussed that, discusses these important distinctions. And you're just now reaching that five minutes. Okay, thank you, Your Honor. We'll reserve our five minutes for rebuttal. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. May it please the court. My name is Roseanne Schreiner. I represent the appellee Joshua Petersheim in this matter. <clears throat> each of Ms. Fry's assignment of errors, each of the five assignment of errors, deal with the issue of whether this was a civil contempt finding. A review of the case law is pretty clear as to what the court needs to find and the burden of proof that needs to be found in order to find a person in civil contempt. More specifically, indirect civil contempt is what the court found Ms. Fry of. With regard to an indirect contempt, civil contempt finding, there needs to be a valid court order, which everyone agreed there was. There needs to be an offending party that had knowledge of that court order, which Ms. Fry admitted that she did have knowledge of it. And there needs to be a finding that that offending party violated that order. The trial court and Ms. Fry, the trial court found it, and Ms. Fry actually admitted to it while she testified at that hearing. And I believe that her attorney also indicated that in opening statements today. So the issue about whether this was a civil contempt, a proper civil contempt finding, it's clear that it was. There's no question that it was. The argument comes down to the punishment that went along with it. I think it's very clear throughout this process that Mr. Petersheim continued to be harmed by her failure to make these payments. There was an initial argument that this motion of contempt should never have been filed by Mr. Petersheim because as of the time that he filed it, she was current with her payments. However, the history shows that there had been eight late payments. There had been two payments that had never been made. And as the trial court indicated, how would Mr. Petersheim know that going forward, those payments were going to be made? So he had, well, counsel, that's always a situation, isn't it? People choose when they file contempt and when they don't. And, and there are many times where you take somebody to court and they hurry up and pay before you get into the court door. And sure. then you have to refile again. You ask for attorney fees, you ask for costs, but then you have to refile again once they miss again, don't you? Isn't that the usual procedure? Well, it depends on when and in what circumstances are surrounding the specific motion. In our case, there is a large history that those payments hadn't been made. There's a history of payments being skipped. And although she may have been current at the time that that was filed, that was not as if she had been current up to that point. It was a last minute making it current, but it was still in his name. He still had the harm to his credit report that was ongoing. Well, couldn't he have sued her for that? Well, I believe when he filed the motion for contempt, one of the reasons that he cited for filing the motion for contempt was not only her failure to pay timely and consistently, it was also the fact that she failed to hold him harmless. But how do you remedy that contempt? Well, you make sure, as he did, that he filed a motion for contempt and that there would be a sanction hanging over her head in order to make sure that those payments were made in the future. But that's a prospective contempt. I think he already had a court order against her. Sure, but we file contempt in order to make people compliant with those orders and to have- That they've already violated. That they've violated, yes. And that they can violate in the future. Looking at what the court needs to find in order to find somebody in civil contempt, there's nothing that says that at the time it files, she needs to be violating the order. It needs to be that there was a valid court order, that the person had knowledge of it, and that person had violated such an order, which is what we had in this case. Except for the trial court specifically said, I'm finding that 
where where the contempt lies is her failure to hold him harmless. Yep. Which I understand it's something that happened, but the whole body of law surrounding the purge would be to purge yourself of what you what the contempt contemptuous act was. And there would be absolutely no way, would there be for her to uh, unring that bell where his credit was affected by her conduct. Well, I think that, again, this may be a perspective thought, but as the trial court indicated, there was nothing that said, there was no reason for this person to believe that this would not be ongoing. And the further dings to his credit or strikes on his credit that there had been payments not made would have further harmed him. So there, there's a level of degree of harm in your, in your correct credit report. And it's going to keep on going and it's going to get worse and worse the more payments that are missed and the more late payments that are made. So in order to make sure that he wasn't further harmed, it was appropriate for her to be found in contempt of that clause. So, so the point is kind of like when a, in a criminal court, when a judge sentences somebody, it is in order to prevent them from committing the offense again. Well, I believe that there is uh, language with regard to a sanction in a civil contempt finding that says that that needs to be co coercive and remedial. Finding somebody in civil contempt for the possibility of further hurting somebody's criminal report or credit report would be coercive in nature, coercing her to obey and to not further injure the party. It seems the filing of the motion accomplished that coercive goal. And that the finding then becomes I don't agree. Um, again, if you look at what you need to find a civil contempt, we have it here. There is no question about that. When we look at what the situation was when he filed, we have it. When we look at when we came down to the final hearing, there were still issues outstanding with regard to if we could help his credit report in any way what we needed to do to make sure that she would follow court orders in the future. It, there was no reason why the court couldn't issue a fee for an attorney fee award in this matter and require that to be something that causes her to be in compliant with the court order. The, the case law doesn't say that the sanction needs to be in direction to following a court order that she was found in contempt of. It needs to be coercive in nature and remedial in nature. So the court was giving her a chance and they purged that sanction, which is what is required as part of a civil contempt sanction. And they issued that with regard to the finding of the attorney's fees. So there's no reason why this court could not have found her in civil contempt and sanctioned her as they did. It's very clear in this case, and although argued by Ms. Fry that she did not have the ability to comply with the court's order, she repeatedly had the ability to comply with the court's order. There were monies that were given to Ms. Fry almost immediately upon the time that she missed several of her payments, and that money was in the amount of $1,300 that was given from my client to Ms. Fry. She received tax refunds during the pendency of her failure to, to make those payments, to miss payments, to continually affect Mr. Petersheim's credit. There's also an argument by Ms. Fry with regard to child support arrears and that she was unable to comply with the court's order in making the payments because Mr. Petersheim was not paying his child support consistently and regularly and that he was in arrears. Well, at the time that the court looked at those arrears, it was $38.69 that he had been in arrears. And those arrears were started because, or accumulated because of the retroactive nature of his child support order. And he had actually paid above and beyond that order in order to chisel this down. Again, more money that could have been used to pay this obligation and hold him harmless. 
With regard to Ms. Fry's argument regarding attorney's fees, it's clear from the record that there was a letter sent uh, by Ms. Fry's counsel to Mr. Petersheim's counsel in October of 2015, indicating that she had complied with the court's order finally and had uh, sold the vehicle, turned it in, and wrapped the debt into a new vehicle purchase. But that had just happened somewhere around that October 2015 letter. Until then, this car remained in my client's name and the loan was in my client's name. This is well after we filed our motion for contempt. I believe the motion for contempt was filed in June of 2015. At that time, Ms. Fry demanded that we dismissed our motion for contempt and that she would not pay any attorney's fees with regard to it. Uh, Mr. Peter Fein, Mr. Petersheim found that absolutely ridiculous, given the fact that he would still be in the same position that he had been when he filed the motion for contempt, had he not filed the motion for contempt, retained an attorney to do so, and incurred costs associated with it. So in the end, because we were unable to settle that issue of attorney's fees, more attorney's fees were accumulated. And it seems like the ongoing theme on Ms. Fry's part is that she's failing to take responsibility of her actions. She may have admitted to them, but she doesn't think she should have any ramifications from those. That she shouldn't have to pay Mr. Peter Shine's attorney's fees. That she shouldn't have to be found in contempt of this court's order. There are orders for a reason. The court expects the parties to follow those orders. And we're asking that this court hold her responsible for failure to follow the court order. Thank you. Thank you. stands for the proposition that when a matter has been resolved, even if untimely resolved, there is nothing to litigate since the purpose of civil contempt is to enforce a court order. And when payment has already been made, there is no order that the court can issue to force compliance. And therefore, the matter is moot. Now, that is not to say that the contempt or under those facts cannot be found in criminal contempt. I acknowledge that. My client did not timely pay the debt and she failed to hold her former husband harmless from that debt. I acknowledge that. But by acknowledging that, I must also note that she was not given due process. She was told she was before the court on civil contempt. Counsel for the person who had filed the contempt had been told that this debt had been paid in full. In a hearing that was held, I believe, in early March of 2016, that debt had been paid in full since August of 2015. I would ask you the same thing that my client asked me. What more could she do to comply with the court's order? To avoid going to jail? To avoid, avoid being fined? And I think the answer is clear. There wasn't anything more she could do. That if the court was going to proceed against her in criminal contempt, the court could punish her, send her to the jail, and levy a fine. She had certain rights if the court was going to proceed in that manner. I advised her of those rights, and those rights included the fact that she did not have to testify, and that the uh, person prosecuting the contempt had to prove the allegations beyond a reasonable doubt. And maybe they could have done that. I'm, that isn't what we're here about. What we're here about is whether or not my client was denied due process by being led to believe that she was in civil contempt proceedings when in fact she was punished in criminal contempt. The court should note that even if Jessica could afford to pay the $1,350 of attorney fees and have her jail time lifted, have her fine lifted, she still would not be in compliance with the original court order. The original court order, what she was found in 
contempt for is failure to hold Mr. Peter Schein harmless. She failed to do that. Going to jail, fining her, paying attorney fees doesn't change that fact. And going to jail, fining her, and paying attorney fees might be appropriate criminal civil contempt sanctions. But that isn't what this is about. This is about a civil proceeding, civil contempt proceeding, as articulated by counsel for Mr. Petersheim, as articulated by the court, as specifically inquired into by me at the beginning of the hearing. Having been denied her due process rights, we believe that this order should be vacated by this court, reversed and vacated. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you both for your presentations today. The court will take the matter under your advisement. We will issue a written decision, which will be mailed to you both sides, as well as posted on the Ohio Supreme Court website.